Macy's is making moves to bring more parks to more people across the country. Throughout April, join Macy's in celebrating Earth Month by supporting Trust for Public Land, whose mission is to transform empty schoolyards into vibrant parks that communities can use outside of school hours. Just round up your next in-store purchase or donate online to Trust for Public Land. Shop sustainable products and learn more from clean beauty business owners at macy's.com purpose. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. Last week, I said to one of my colleagues, oh, did you read so-and-so's new book? And he was like, the one that she published like four years ago? Oh, yeah, it's been sitting on my <laughs> shelf looking at me for four years. Welcome to How To. I'm Carvel Wallace. I'm always so interested in what you, our lovely listeners, need help with. We get life optimization questions, we get identity questions, tangly relationship questions, but sometimes it's a question that's just deeply relatable. Hi, my name is Kate, and I live in San Francisco. First of all, the How to Love Your Face episode broke me in all the best ways, so thank you for that. I am hoping you can help me become a reader again. I'm dyslexic, so I was late to reading, and it's always a little harder for me. But there were times in my life where I was in book clubs and enjoyed it and did it and learned things and fueled my intellectual curiosity, and that has stopped. And I, I'd like to reconnect with that. For many of us, reading is a thing that ebbs and flows. Maybe your first introduction to it is as a source of comfort. We cuddle with a parent before bed as they read us stories and show us pictures. Then we're doing it on our own, and it becomes a challenge. We're trying to decipher words and conquer harder and harder concepts. Eventually something clicks, and we're able to dive into other worlds, swept away by words all on our own. But somewhere along the line, maybe in school, maybe for work, it becomes a chore. It takes effort to prioritize it, consistency, intentionality, even compromise. Life seems to always get in the way. But there's a reason why so many of us are looking to rekindle our relationship with reading right now. You're not the first person I've asked to help me with this. So before the pandemic, I was at one of my high schools. Kate teaches sex ed to students and parents at different schools around the Bay Area. I'm always the new kid at the table, right? <laughs> I sat down and a teacher I like a lot was talking to a group of people about books. And I was tired and my sensor was down. I said, oh, I don't read. And she looked like aghast. And she's like, Kate, I don't know that we can be friends if you don't read. Wow. This is somebody I like. This is somebody I want to respect. Mm -hmm. this is, right? All of those things. And it sat mm -hmm. with me. And then the pandemic happened. So I did not see her in two years. When I came back, I was like, hey, I actually want to be a reader. And I don't know how. And you teach English. What do you think? And she had book suggestions and none of them sounded like ones I wanted to read and she finally was yeah. like you know it's okay if you're not a reader that's fine too a little bit of the like you're a grown-up you get to choose what you want to do and I was like oh, okay and I thought about it and then yeah I thought about it more and I was like no I actually really want to be a reader like I really do see that I'm missing some great source of pleasure in the world that I I kind of want in on that party so today on the show we're picking up where Kate's friends and colleagues have left off. We're going to try and figure out why Kate and why so many of us have stopped reading. And we'll figure out if we can rejoin the bibliophile party. Stay with us. Creating visual content is an essential part of business, but the creative process isn't always easy. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I was trying to create a website, and I'm going to be honest with you, I know nothing about designing websites, much less videos or social posts or all the other things that we're supposed to do nowadays. 
And so I went to Canva. Canva for Teams makes it easy to collaborate and design with others, which makes the whole process so much more creative and fun. The thing that makes Canva so great is the endless templates and premium fonts and the photos and graphics and videos and everything that you can use to add yourself, your personality, and a little bit of edge to your team's content. Collaborate with Canva for Teams. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you go to canva.me slash howto. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash howto for a free 45-day extended trial. Canva.me slash how to. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned how to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. To understand Kate's relationship with the written word, we first need to turn the clock back nearly 35 years. I am dyslexic. I was a dyslexic kid back before people knew what to do with us. I started reading really late. I didn't read till I was in fourth grade, and I really struggled. So... For those listeners who don't understand, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a reader with dyslexia? Well, I've never been a reader who wasn't dyslexic. So this is me mm -hmm. guessing. What it I'm guessing it feels like is when you have a heavy backpack and you're going for a walk, you know, and everybody else <laughs> doesn't have the heavy backpack. It's just harder and I'm slower. When I'm not being attentive, I can see that I just look at the shape of the word and fill it in. I think, but don't know that it makes me more tired than it does. I mean, I live with people who really love to read and really just like would like to be left alone to only read. And I don't want to do it when I don't feel good. When I've worked all day and the kids are demanding my cognitive, you know, they want my attention and I'm thinking and I'm commuting and my brain is tired. I want to look at my phone and have it feed me stuff that's easy to think about. We'll talk more about dyslexia and the reading brain later. But for now, what you need to know is that even without a ton of support in school, Kate figured out her own way of absorbing written information. I became good enough at it that I could finish school and finish graduate school I read for utility until I was in my early 30s. And then I got really sick and I was like not doing anything for a long time. And it was before cell phones and stuff. And so I, I read Agatha Christie novels. And, you know, I was too sick to do anything fun. I was in my room, but it was like this glorious escape and I enjoyed it. And And my husband would be like, this is the year you became a reader. You get it now. And I wasn't reading it for a purpose and I wasn't reading it to complete the assignment or because I wanted to have the content or the information. Yeah. And I was working in Berkeley when I started to recover and I we worked our, our office was above this big used bookstore and I would go down on Fridays and buy whatever Agatha Christie I hadn't bought. And I was not well enough to do anything fun on the weekends yet. And so then I would lie in bed one of the weekend days and read the Agatha Christie. And then that was pretty good, right? That's a pretty nice mm -hmm. way to spend a day. Mm -hmm. Like now that I have two children, mm -hmm. that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that moment of like escape and fun, and I, I think I liked that I knew that there was going to be the payoff at the end. And nothing too, I mean, they're murders, but nothing too horrible happens. I even joined a, a book club. I almost never finished the book in time. Sometimes they would pick a book two months ahead and I'd get like, the next one, so I'd like double the amount of time I had for it. But I enjoyed it. All of this was a big deal to Kate. Participating in a book club, finding joy in books, just being a reader felt right. And then in 2016, I had a preterm birth. So our daughter was born early and didn't make it. And I went into grief 
and I stopped being able to read. And I think that's a really common grief response is to not have like lose your focus and concentration. The thing that felt not common for me is that it is 2023 <laughs> mm. and I'm still mm -hmm. really struggling. And I have had another daughter since then. I have a four-year-old. She is delightful. Mm -hmm. This was a hard part of my life that is f past, right? I, mm. I'm not in active grief. I'm, I'm have moved on, but every time I pick up a book, it feels like homework and mm. I don't like it. So here's the thing. There are so many reasons why people fall off the reading bandwagon. Kate happens to have a very specific moment in time that she can point to. You listening at home may have one as well. But I'd wager that a lot of us don't have one inciting moment. Instead, we just drifted apart from our books. Simple distractions sucked us in. Family, binge-worthy TV shows, jobs, relationships, social media. Life got in the way. Which is why I wanted to bring in someone who could give us some insight. Marianne Wolf studies the reading brain for a living, and she might actually be uniquely positioned to understand Kate's current conundrum. My first reaction was to leave my stance of a neuroscientist. Kate has experienced several things that are really hard. I'll just say with something I almost never say, but I had a lot of miscarriages, one at the very end, and you never get over that. And there is no question that whether we call it grief or the time it takes to return slowly to our full life, whatever that takes, there's a toll. And it's a toll that's not to be forgotten and to be made part of our ability to understand others. Besides having a similar personal journey with grief, Marianne is the director of the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at UCLA. And her most recent book is called Reader, Come Home. Around the same time that Kate couldn't pick up a book, Marianne too found herself struggling. She wasn't being whisked away, and she didn't find herself deeply immersed. Instead, reading felt utilitarian, just a way of gathering information. So she decided to conduct an experiment and revisit one of her favorite books, The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse. And she found herself frustrated with the book's tangly sentences and slow narrative. In short, she no longer had the cognitive patience to find joy in the book. We've become different readers, most of us. We are on the screen anywhere from 5 to 12, 15 hours a day. You know, it depends on your job, it depends on you, but a lot of time. And a lot of that time is busily being distracted. We're doing multiple things at once, none of which, like Kate said, is without distraction. Like everyone, I'm guilty of starting a task and then getting it interrupted and then not finishing the task, but it's not the same. If I am not looking at my email and my phone's not near me, you know, I'll get into flow state with it. I really enjoyed your own um, self appraisal that when your phone isn't there, you're more able to immerse yourself. Well, the real word here for the reading brain is immersion. And it is by no means a simple thing. Um, most people totally take reading for granted because they don't know what in the world it really does to the brain. Okay, here's a fun fact you can take to your next book club. Did you know that humans' ability to read didn't naturally evolve? Sight and hearing naturally evolved, but reading is cultural. It's passed down through teaching. In fact, humans only started reading around five or 6,000 years ago, which isn't that long considering modern humans date back 200,000 years. So why are we able to read at all? Well, it's because of our brain's neuroplasticity. 
when we start reading, we are connecting perception, you know, the letters and the words, to the sounds, to the meanings and how they're used in sentences. It's a very basic little circuitry in the brain, you know, it's connecting all these parts. But as we become better and better readers, we are elaborating, we are growing that circuitry. So by the time we become an expert reader, we have gathered together interactively some of the most complex cognitive processes we possess as human beings and some of the deepest forms of feeling. We, when we are immersed, are doing what I call deep reading. So when we read, there are a few different levels of complexity. The first is simply, do we comprehend what is being told to us? Can we literally interpret the letters and sentences? With that, we can read for understanding and information gathering. We quickly skim, not stopping to really reflect or contemplate or empathize. It's utilitarian. I am a fan of audiobooks for some things. And one of those things is for people who are really struggling with reading that's a good way to get information. But you see, that's very much, it's like a second version of that basic circuit. Here's the basic circuit. And there's a second one. The second one was we're getting that information. We're making an analogy with what we know. We're discarding some things. We're really looking a little harder at others. So we are paying attention, but mm -hmm. not at the level of this full elaborated, complex circuitry that's the expert reading brain that can leave the self behind. Leaving the self behind. That's deep reading, or the third circuit. It's the one that allows us to be transported, to connect with characters, to analyze and empathize. That's the thing we're seeking when we want that transformational reading experience, the one that we want to make part of our identity. Yet for Kate, and for many of us, that's the circuit that's hardest to access. You know, mysteries are really good for inference, inferential mm. process. You take a clue, but you are, you are your own little Sherlock Holmes, or mm -hmm. I think Miss Marple's a better mm -hmm. one because she mm -hmm. takes not only information, but she takes feelings. So Miss Marple is a better reading brain model for me than Sherlock, <laughs> but Sherlock's great. And that's using induction, deduction, all these inferential processes, analogy. And that's a fair amount of this. I mean, I am also struggling to get back into reading and actually someone just recommended um, Louise Penny books, which are like kind of also cozy murder mysteries set outside Quebec. And I like I haven't even started yet, but as soon as that someone said that, no, they're really well written and they're cozy mysteries. I was like, that is what I need yes. right now. So there's something to that. Your choice of mysteries is such a beautiful one because you see, you've got the template. Mm -hmm. You have the template down. You are immersed in, in a certain sense, but you aren't immersing your entire intellect. You're immersing part of it, mm -hmm. and you're having fun. And thank God for fun. You know, with reading, yeah. I want joy. I want fun. That call for fun is actually our first tip. You don't need to read the classics or really any book just because someone said so. It could be the most well-written book in the world, but if you're not interested in the subject matter, you're going to struggle. Simple as that. So set aside what you think you should read and pick up something that you want to read. If you're struggling for what that is, try a bridge. What was the last book that you actually liked? Try something else by that author. If no books are coming to mind, then what was the last YouTube rabbit hole you went down? Maybe there's some subject matter inspiration in there. And if all else fails, there's a ton of book curation lists or even influencers on TikTok who make content for people trying to find their next read. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, but coming up, we've got some more tactical tips for slipping into deep reading mode. So grab a bookmark and come right back.
This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen. I'm a big fan of Headspace, but the person who's more of a fan is my wife. Because she tells me that when I use Headspace, when I use it to kind of get myself centered in the morning or before I go to bed, she says I'm a much nicer person to be around. And I think she's probably right. The last few years have taught us how important mental health is to our overall state of well-being. If you're anything like me, your life is all about stress and anxiety and sleep problems, and that's all changed with Headspace. Headspace helps improve mental health through guided meditations, mindfulness practices, breathing and calming exercises, and so much more. Headspace has helped more than 100 million people worldwide, and they can help you, too. Listen up. You do not want to miss this. For a limited time, all of you can try Headspace for free for 30 days by going to headspace.com slash how to 30. You will not find an offer like this anywhere else. Use the link H-E-A-D-S-P-A-C-E dot com slash how to 30 to unlock all of Headspace for free for 30 days. This is not something that they normally do. Headspace.com slash how to 30. If you're the parent of a college bound student, you're probably feeling mixed emotions right now as acceptance letters and financial aid offers arrive excited and proud of your student, but also stressed thinking about how you're going to pay for it all. That's why you should check out College Ave Student Loans. They're your emotional support system to guide you through the college journey from start to finish. With College Ave, you'll get free access to tools and resources that make the financial road to college easier, like their student loan calculator that lets you see how a future loan can work for you in your budget. Plus, every month, they give away a $1,000 scholarship to one lucky family. Entering is fast and easy, and winning could have a big impact on your college expenses. To learn more, visit collegeav.com slash howto. It's a better student loan experience. There's no purchase necessary to enter or win the scholarship. See official contest rules for details at collegeav.com slash howto. We're back with our expert, Marianne Wolf, author of the book, Reader Come Home, and our listener, Kate. You know, many lifetimes ago, I had this job teaching SAT prep to high school students. And when it came to the reading comprehension portion, invariably we noticed that kids could read the essays competently while their minds were somewhere else entirely. But then when it came time for the comprehension questions, they were lost. The task then became how to make sure the reader's wandering brain was being used to think about the topic rather than about what to get for lunch or who to ask to prom. The method we taught was to ask yourself questions about the reading while you did the reading. Why is this character making this choice? What did the author intend to do with this passage? What just happened in that paragraph? What do you think is going to happen next? We learned that when readers weren't afraid to actively reread, summarize, or even mark up the passage, their insights into the text deepened and their comprehension improved. We skim, 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 skim. And when you skim, you miss so much, including beauty. You know, you, you, you miss the complexity sometimes of arguments, but you miss also the great efforts by those authors who are really looking at the novel or or whatever they're writing as the most, if you will, the closest they can come to use words to convey their best thoughts. And that goes out the window when you skim. I'm really struck by this notion that deep reading involves a kind of an abandonment of the self, not not in the negative way, but in a kind of positive way that like you forget the self and you go elsewhere. 
And it makes me wonder if when there is grief or struggle or trouble at home, especially if you feel responsible for people, like as a mother and a partner, maybe, if there is some fear about what will happen if you leave the self behind, if you feel like there's actually space for you to do that, or if you feel compelled to like stay here and tend to all of the things that have to be tended to, two children, yourself, your students, your grief, if there is a feeling that like, I can't actually go Mm-hmm. elsewhere because I have, I'm needed here. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if that resonates with you at all. Parts of it do. I did have a couple books I've read in the last few years I enjoyed. And one of them, I was finishing sitting in the park with the sunshine while my daughter and her friend played. And I did lose the four-year-olds three times <laughs> that day. <laughs> where I like looked up and was like, yeah. shit! Yeah. Where the, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Where are the kids? Yeah. Right? And they're fine. They're in a park. They're in yeah. a playground. There's a fence. Yeah, it's just yeah. they got out of one yeah. fence. We're in a different fence. And oh, gosh. Yeah. So when I went to drop off the friend, dad's like, how'd it go? And I was like, well, I did lose the children three times. And he's like, well, I found them. <laughs> so there's, a, there's some of that. <laughs> now, you may be thinking, that sounds lovely, but I simply don't have the time. Well, then you might like hearing Marianne's next insight. Whether it's for a person with dyslexia who has a laboriousness issue or whether it is the distracted contemporary reader who's just a skimmer. For both, I have learned making a discipline of 15 minutes a day of a book that you love or that you really want to read. You know, I, the idea of putting together 15 awake minutes um, <laughs> feels like absolutely impossible at this moment. I could get 15 exhausted minutes, um, which may be what it takes, but 15 my brain is functioning well minutes feels like a big, maybe, you know, and if school's going to be over, it's going to be break, it's like life's going to calm down, but that feels like a big ask. And then the losing myself it's not that I think I am someone who is very empathic. And I have found sometimes that when I read stuff, the empathy I feel for the characters is so painful, mm-hmm. I don't want to read it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Or I'm scared to open it because what if I fall mm-hmm. in love with this character and then, and then mm-hmm. horrible things happen to this character? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that feels really anxiety provoking. So when I'm looking mm-hmm. at fiction, it's, mm-hmm. you know, well, I like the Miss Marple because I know <laughs> like nothing bad's happening. Um, a couple of the books that I read, like I could tell, like, all right, this could be one that everything turns out okay in the end, right? The, um, <laughs> my problem with those is that often the ones you can tell everything's going to be okay in the end aren't that well written and aren't that compelling. Mm -hmm. Uh Yeah, so then it's like, well, I'm not Mm -hmm. worried about, you know, genocide happening in the middle of this book or whatever, but it's also not... It's almost like it... Mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder a lot about bad... As a writer, I think a lot about bad writing and my Mm -hmm. own bad writing. You know, I'm like, am I... And um, I love what you said, Marianne, about um, the different kinds of circuitry um, between sort of shallower forms of reading and deep reading. Mm-hmm. And is it true that good writing, quote unquote, meaning that there's, you know, I mean, you could argue what good writing is and there's all kinds of stuff, but let's just say that we're talking about, um, for you, the reader, you experience a variety of sentences, you, you experience vocabulary that excites you and interests you, you experience vocabulary that like gives, that fires lots of synapses for you and kind of helps you make connections. There's that, that imagery. Yeah. There's imagery for you that mm-hmm. feels alive, that having those things in place all allow you to have a deeper reading experience than it does if it's sort of like cliche after cliche after cliche, mm-hmm. uh, flat sentence after flat sentence. Mm-hmm. Um, is that sort of true in your experience? Absolutely. But I would also say, along with Kate, that sometimes the very powerful nature of some writing can actually repel you 
And mm -hmm. let me just give you an example. This was straight out of what Kate's saying. I'm sure, Kate, you're more empathic than I am. I mean, I can just tell. But I am empathic too. And for my birthday, I took my favorite novelist, Marilyn Robinson. I'd read all her other mm -hmm. books. And I took Jack on my birthday. My kids took me to Hawaii. And I started absolutely becoming totally depressed over her ability to depict the consciousness of this man, Jack. And mm -hmm. the power of her writing was so amazing that it caused all this, but I had to stop. I mm -hmm. literally had to stop. Deep reading isn't always beautiful and fun. That's what I would say. But I think deep reading is enhanced, Carvel, by those, mm -hmm. you know, like Italo Calvino always said that he is making every effort to find the perfect word or set of words to convey the best of his thoughts. And mm -hmm. when you when you experience that, you go with the author. You go down into the depths of those words. And, and language is amazing because it, when done correctly, language leads you like the wild duck to dive down. And that can be a, an incredibly wonderful experience. Or what Kate just said, it can be a hard experience too. Yeah, and mm. I don't and, want any more hard experiences. Yeah, and I, I yeah. truly would advise you, yeah. Kate, <laughs> yeah. unlike the rest of the people I might <laughs> talk to, I would choose beautiful writing that's joyous and that causes you to think and to feel. And, and the word I would use is not to abandon the self, but there's a theological term called passing over, to pass over and come back, pass mm. over into that character, pass over into the author's efforts to communicate to you and come back. But, you know, life is short. I would find out <laughs> there's a really terrible ending. I don't recommend Iris Murdoch, for example. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I love her writing. Yeah. I love it. But sometimes the end was so bad, I just hated it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're deep reading. You don't want to be stuck in the bottom mm -hmm. of the, you know, the, the kelp forest. <laughs> Marianne is talking about something really important here and something that just so happens to be one of my favorite concepts, pleasure. She's talking about how to remember that reading can, and maybe even should be, pleasurable. And that if you want to have a working relationship with it, that pleasure has to be pretty well near the forefront. After all, who among us wants to spend time in a relationship that's consistently boring, demanding, stressful, and difficult? We recognize that these things may come up from time to time, but in order for something to be sustainable, we have to enjoy it. So let yourself discard reading that isn't pleasurable. Doesn't matter if it's good or if won all the awards or if everyone in your timeline is screaming, read this book. Is it bringing you joy? If not, screw it. Let yourself toss books aside so you can find the ones you want to hold on to. Look for writing that makes you feel alive, human, interested, excited, maybe even turned on. Give yourself plenty of time to get into something. If it takes a few weeks or 15 minutes a day, so be it. What's the rush? There's no test at the end of this. Remember, you are reading as a way to take care of you. And you get to do that however you want. Let's figure out a plan for what you might do going forward based on what you've heard today. Like, how might you cobbled together a sort of reading strategy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help get you to where you want to go. I heard something about time limits, like setting a small period of time to read and 
whether that's in the morning and at night or whether that's a, a place that I like used to like to steal time when my kids were little was in the car before I left work or after, I, you know what I mean? Like, or I'd pull over somewhere and read a, a little bit in the car, do whatever I needed to do in the car before coming home, knowing that as soon as I got in the door, it was going to be, you know, it's over. It's like the, me is over. Um, what else did you hear that you feel like you might try? Well, I was thinking about layers of reading. And I was wondering mm-hmm. if I might not stick with the easier layer of reading to start. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe getting some books by that mystery author that you recommended mm-hmm. and seeing if that was like a bridge and, and was pleasurable and didn't feel like homework. And maybe if I had some more not feeling like homework books that then... I would be like, okay, I'm ready for a little, like something a little bit more. So I could see that working. I could see, I mean, talking with my family, <laughs> saying, hey, this is something I want to do. The The boys would be very excited, my, my, my husband uh-huh. and son, if, uh-huh. right, because that would give them permission to not fold laundry after dinner also, right? Because that's what's uh-huh. going on. <laughs> yeah. Because if I'm, we're sitting yeah. and reading, it means we're not doing chores. Um, yeah. So we could do a little bit of that. And then I think the, the the thing I haven't solved for yet is what's my new source of books given me, yeah. you know, other than having a million librarians at my disposable, I, I don't have I mean, <laughs> a million librarians and yeah, the best yeah. humans on earth yeah. are yeah. school librarians. Yes. I yeah. also believe yeah. this. Yes. So short of getting one of them to send me some books, I don't have... I don't know where to go with that. You know, this is the one of the reasons readers like series because it's sort of like an answer to the the what to read next question. Um, So that's one thing. Another thing that I'll I'll just say is that the homework thing, again, continues to kind of rattle around in my brain. And it feels to me like a lot of your reading experience is connected to expectations. Mm -hmm. The nebulous reading world in which you would like to operate, expectations, the book club, or perhaps maybe most intense, the, your internalized expectations about what kind of books you should be reading. Mm-hmm. And one thing I really heard from Marianne is actually that we're looking for the books that bring us joy. If it's not sparking joy, to borrow a popular phrase from years ago, then maybe we just put it down. Yeah. Like no judgment, no harm, no foul. And if we want to give it another shot, we come back and give it another shot. So I just want to thank you, Kate, for being a wonderful person to talk to. I wish you the absolute best in finding joy in reading. And uh, I, I think even our conversation helped us both think about what you might choose next to find your ideal reading experience. You know what I think we're going to do also when we do this episode is we're going to ask our listeners if they have any advice. Um, yes. And oh, yes. Would that be cool? Would you like that? Because, well, yeah, because yeah. I'm telling you, I am not the only yeah. person. Well, and they might have book suggestions. Yeah, I think that's how we're going to do this. We're going to figure this out together. We would genuinely love to know about your relationship with reading. How do you keep up the habit? What book can you not put down? What author sparks that joy? What was the last book you got lost in? Please write to us at howto at slate.com or call the How To Hotline and leave us a voicemail at 646-495-4001. We're going to pass your suggestions along to Kate and feature them in an upcoming episode. Are you stuck on a chapter of your life? If so, reach out to us at howto at slate.com or call the howto hotline and leave us a voicemail at 646 495 4001. A huge thank you to Kate for coming to us with this question and to Marianne Wolf for her useful advice. Be sure to check out her latest book, Reader Come Home. Finally, if you found this episode helpful, please give us a rating and a review, or better yet, tell a friend. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producers, Derek John, Rosemary Belson, Kevin Bendis, and Jabari Butler produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. Amanda Ripley is my co-host, and I'm Carvel Wallace. Thanks for listening.
At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned, doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned how to snowboard, also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.